Welcome to the lecture entitled, What is Science? What is Philosophy? What is the Philosophy of Science? I'm Andrew Chapman. In this lecture, we'll cover eight topics. One, the nature and purpose of the empirical sciences. Two, the unified nature of the empirical sciences. Three, the demarcation criterion, scientific methodology, and scientific progress. Four, the nature and purpose of philosophy. Five, the a priori, a posteriori distinction. Six, the descriptive normative distinction. Seven, the nature and purpose of the philosophy of science. And eight, the necessity of philosophy for science. What is science? The question, what is science, is one that has plagued scientists and philosophers for millennia, and as we'll see by the end of this lecture, an adequate answer to the question, what is science, requires an entirely philosophical investigation into science itself. At this time in the lecture, we can settle for painting science in broad strokes that form an admittedly incomplete picture of what science is. For now, let's say, science is a human investigative endeavor whose object is the natural world and natural phenomena. Science is a tool that is developed and employed by humans, like you and me, when we interrogate the natural world. Science looks to understand the natural world, and part of this understanding includes explanation and prediction of natural phenomena. Now, understanding explanation and prediction all happen at the level of the inner workings of the natural world. To understand the natural world, to explain the natural world, or to predict the natural world or natural phenomena, scientists develop theories whose purpose is large-scale explanation and prediction of natural phenomena in general. The goal of the scientist isn't to catalog individual occurrences of natural phenomena, like, for example, one particular meteor shower, or one waterfall occurring at one instance in time, but instead is to say what it is about the natural world in general that allows for and brings about all of the natural phenomena. Merely cataloging or writing down a list of all of the individual occurrences of natural phenomena might tell you what happened, and so it might be a job for a historian. However, it won't tell you how or why what happened happened. Answering these how and why questions, that's the job of the scientist. While there are many different individual sciences, or as we'll say, special sciences, such as physics or chemistry or biology, there's something about all of these special sciences that makes them all sciences, despite the fact that they're different. Thus, the sciences are unified in some way. They form part of a whole. They're connected together in some way. This unification comes largely in terms of the methodology of science. There's a strict regimentation within science and in scientific practice regarding which scientific hypotheses, explanations, and theories are considered acceptable ones and which are considered unacceptable ones. 
This regimentation revolves in large part around the justification that scientists have for particular hypotheses, explanations, and theories. Scientific justification, as compared to other sorts of justification, is largely empirical in nature, and no doubt you've heard that term empirical before, and that's where the empirical sciences get half of their name. Empirical here just means experiential, or from experience, or coming from the senses. Another term that we'll see here for empirical or experiential is a posteriori. It's important to get the a in there. It's two different words, a posteriori, that come together to form that term. And that means simply after experience. It seems as though the standard thought that most people have, what we might call the pre-theoretical or pre-philosophical thought about science, is that there is a nature or an essence or a core to science. There's something that science has that allows science to do what it does, and that unifies the different special sciences like physics, and chemistry, and biology under the umbrella of the term, the concept, science. Identifying the nature or essence of science would allow us to do three very important things. First, identifying the nature or essence of science would allow us to say which things are science and which things are not science. This project of separating things into science and non-science is known as demarcation. Second, identifying the nature or essence of science would allow us to determine the best methodology for scientists to employ to achieve their scientific goals. If we don't know what science is and what science is supposed to be doing, then only accidentally might we stumble into a good methodology. However, if we know what science is, what its essence or its nature is, then we can devise a methodology that promotes that nature. Third, Identifying the essence or the nature of science would allow us to say what scientific progress looks like and when scientific progress has been made or when scientific progress hasn't been made. The issue of progress is related to, although different from, the issue of scientific methodology. You might think that once we know what the nature or essence of science is, once we've created a methodology that promotes the nature or essence of science, and once we follow that methodology successfully, we will have made scientific progress. Thus, the issues here of the essence of science, demarcation between science and non-science, scientific methodology, and the making of scientific progress are all bound up with one another such that a solution or an answer to any one of these issues seems to be a solution or answer to the other three as well. Let's turn now to philosophy. What is philosophy? Well, philosophy is, in broad strokes, a sort of investigation that's practiced by novices and by experts, by amateurs and by professionals alike. It's the oldest of the academic disciplines, and it's the one that, more than any other, has influenced the structure of colleges, of universities, and of academia in general. Philosophers are very good at asking complex, baffling questions and providing answers to various and sundry sorts of questions that they ask on what can seem like countless topics. 
But the goal of the philosopher isn't just to ask baffling questions. The goal of the philosopher is the same as the goal of any other investigator, and that's to figure out how things actually are. Philosophy is concerned with questions of essences. What are things at their core? What are things at their most central, fundamental, foundational levels? So philosophy is an investigation, and it's an investigation of essences. What is the evidence? What's the method that philosophy uses? The evidence that's used by philosophers is reason, argumentation, and interpersonal interaction with other philosophers and other people. While philosophers do sometimes turn to evidence provided by sensory sources, and recall, that's known as a posteriori evidence, since philosophy is concerned not with what is merely occurring out there in the empirical world, but instead with what couldn't have failed to occur because it's essential, it's necessary, or how things are essentially, much of the time, sensory evidence just is irrelevant to philosophical questions. Now, that doesn't mean that sensory evidence is irrelevant to all things or the most important things. It's just that when discovering the essences of things, since essences aren't generally the sorts of things that can be seen or heard, tasted, smelled, touched, philosophers need to use reason and argumentation in order to try to answer philosophical questions about essences. What then is the methodology of philosophy? The methodology that's used by philosophers is varied, and different philosophical schools have developed based around different philosophical methodologies. Some philosophers think that philosophy should be conducted in a way that's analogous to, although not identical to, given the non-empirical nature of philosophical evidence, the natural sciences themselves. And some philosophers think that philosophy should have an entirely unique methodology that looks nothing like scientific methodology, and philosophers fall in between these two poles. As we've already noted, philosophical justification is largely non-empirical in nature. And non-empirical means non-experiential or independent of experience or not determined by the senses. And another word for non-empirical here is a priori, meaning simply before experience. Again, with this term a priori, it's important to get the a in there, just as it is with a posteriori. Now, the fact that philosophical justification is non-empirical or a priori does not mean that this justification has no relation at all to the empirical. The non-empirical nature of philosophy simply means that philosophical evidence and argumentation, and conclusions are not entirely based on empirical, sensory, a posteriori sources. We've now seen these terms a priori and a posteriori used in this lecture, so let's take some time to get very very clear on their meanings. And these are not merely pieces of philosophical jargon that are used by philosophers so that they can baffle other people. These terms are terms that are used by philosophers for very specific purposes in very specific ways. And unless we understand their meanings, and unless we're fluent with these terms, Understanding the distinction between science and philosophy, understanding the need for the philosophy of science, and understanding pretty much any other issue in the philosophy of science will be very difficult.
A priori and a posteriori are adjectives, they're descriptions, that pick out a distinction between types of evidence, justification, investigative methodologies, conclusions, and pieces of knowledge. Thus, there can be a priori evidence, a priori justification, a priori methodologies, a priori conclusions, and a priori knowledge. And there can be a posteriori evidence, a posteriori justification, a posteriori methodologies, a posteriori conclusions, and a posteriori pieces of knowledge. And to remind you, a priori means before or without sensory evidence, and a posteriori means after or with or because of sensory evidence. The a priori, a posteriori distinction is a mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive distinction. So take a piece of justification just as an example. The a priori, a posteriori distinction is mutually exclusive in that the justification that is our example is either a priori justification or it's a posteriori justification, but it can't be both. That's what mutually exclusive means. It's one or the other, but not both. And the distinction is jointly exhaustive in that the justification, that is our example here, must be either a priori justification or a posteriori justification. There is no third option, so the two have exhausted all of the options. If something is a posteriori, that means that it's entirely derived from the senses. There's no non-empirical or non-sensory content in that thing. On the other hand, if something is a priori, then at least some of it, although it doesn't have to be all of it, just at least some of it is not derived from the senses. There's at least some non-empirical or non-sensory content in that thing. In order to determine whether some piece of evidence or justification or a methodology or a conclusion or an instance of knowledge is a priori or a posteriori, you can ask yourself, does this thing, the methodology or conclusion or piece of knowledge, piece of evidence, piece of justification, have any non-empirical content in it? Is there something in this that I didn't derive directly from experience? If your answer is yes, then you've got yourself something a priori. If the answer is no, on the other hand, then you've got yourself something a posteriori. So just one example here of the distinction. Currently, I'm looking at my water bottle as I record this lecture. The water bottle is blue. I believe that the water bottle is blue because of that justification. The justification is a posteriori because there's nothing in the justification other than stuff that I got through my senses. The justification is just the blueness of the bottle. On the other hand, I know that all bachelors are unmarried. And I know that, let's make up a fictional person here, John is a bachelor. What else do I know about John then? Well, I can conclude from that that John is unmarried. But how did I get from those two statements to the conclusion that John was unmarried? Well, I did it based on some a priori knowledge I have about how those sorts of statements are related to each other. There's more in that statement, the conclusion, than was contained in any sensory evidence that I could have. Since we're talking difficult distinctions right now, let's do one more. The descriptive normative distinction. This will be also very important for us as we investigate science and philosophy and the philosophy of science and the relations between all of them. When you make a claim, when you say something, rather than when you ask a question or you make a demand, 
what you're doing is expressing what's known as a declarative proposition. You're declaring something. You're saying something. Declarative propositions come in two varieties that are, you guessed it, mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive. These two varieties are descriptive propositions and normative propositions. Descriptive propositions are ones that make claims about what is, was, or will be the case. They describe the world. Of course, descriptive propositions can be either true or false depending on whether they are accurate or inaccurate, respectively, descriptions of the thing that they're trying to talk about. Normative propositions, on the other hand, are ones that make claims about how things ought to be or how things ought to have been. And of course, normative propositions can be either true or false depending on whether they are accurate or inaccurate, respectively. Sometimes the descriptive normative distinction is called the is-ought distinction. An example here. The President of the United States is the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. That is true, but also it's a descriptive claim that says what is the case. The President of the United States is 10 feet tall. That's also a descriptive claim. It tries to say what is the case, but it's false. The President of the United States ought to be honest with the American people. That's a normative proposition. It says what ought to be the case. Now, maybe that's true. Maybe there are cases, on the other hand, where the president ought to lie to the people of the United States. Who knows? But notice here that because something ought to be the case, that doesn't mean that it is the case. And because something is the case, that doesn't mean that it ought to be the case. Let's turn now to the philosophy of science. Now, we already know what philosophy is, and we already know what science is, so since philosophy is concerned with questions of essences, and since science is a tool that's used to explain, predict, and understand the workings of the natural world, we can just deduce from that that the philosophy of science is the discipline that's concerned with the essences of the tool that's used to explain, predict, and understand the workings of the natural world. Sure, but that definition isn't all that helpful. It's also very wordy. What is it, we might wonder, that the philosophy of science does in practice? What's the relationship between the philosophy of science and science itself? Why should scientists care about the philosophy of science, and should they? And why should we care, all of us here, who aren't scientists, or maybe who are just studying science but aren't practicing scientists, why should we care about the philosophy of science? These are the sorts of questions that we would want to answer before we could feel like we had a real grip on what the philosophy of science is. Recall science's domain, its purview, the stuff that science investigates and is directed towards. Science is directed at the phenomena of the natural world, and science was developed by humans as a tool for investigating the natural world. The goal of science is to explain and to predict and to understand the phenomena of the natural world by getting at the inner workings of the natural world, the stuff that holds the natural world together that makes stuff happen. However, it would be impossible for us to use science as a tool to investigate the natural world were it the case that systematic and theoretical investigation of science's foundations was not possible. That is, science can only function because we, the people who use science, are able to investigate and evaluate how science itself functions. So think about this. The only reason 
that cars, automobiles, are able to function is because we're able to look at the cars from the outside to determine which parts of the cars are working and which aren't. If something breaks down, we can figure that out, or maybe someone smarter than us, a mechanic, can figure that out. It would be impossible for us to have cars if we couldn't ever investigate in some sort of systematic way what was working about cars and what was not working about cars. To see this in the case of science, let's just consider a few questions about science. When a chemist arrives at her laboratory in the morning, how does she know which activities that she's going to engage in count as continuing her research and which activities count as abandoning her research altogether? That might seem like a silly question, but think for a second. How does the scientist know to continue the experiments from yesterday rather than burning all of the copies of the results of the experiments from yesterday? How does she know that? When a high school student considers studying physics in college and asks his high school physics teacher which schools he should apply to, how does his teacher know what advice to give? Again, at first this seems like sort of a silly question. Why wouldn't the teacher just tell the student which are the best physics schools? But how does the teacher know what counts as a good physics school and what doesn't count as a good physics school? How does the teacher know what counts as good or bad in science education? When new geological data appear to be incompatible with well-established geological theories, how do geologists know whether to question the data, or the theories, or both, or something else entirely? How do scientists know what thing is making their experiments, their theories, their explanations break down? How do they know where to turn? When a psychologist develops a new clinical methodology that's supported by all of the data, but that is out of line with current APA guidelines, how does the APA and how do other psychologists know how to respond? Is it acceptable for the APA to allow this psychologist to practice a clinical methodology that's out of line with the current guidelines, or is that unacceptable? What should happen? Notice here that none of these questions is specifically about the natural phenomena themselves. The question of how the chemist continues doing chemistry isn't a chemical question. The question of how the physics teacher knows how good physics research is conducted isn't a question about physical particles. Instead, these sorts of questions are about scientific theory, about the relationship between evidence and theory, about the relationship between old and new interpretations of evidence and data, about how scientific traditions and the scientific community should be viewed by practicing scientists, about which methodologies are the better ones and which are worse, about what progress looks like, and about what science is at its most fundamental, foundational level. But. Since science itself is directed at the natural world, and not at science, science doesn't study science, science studies the natural world, systematic and theoretical evaluation of science's foundations can't be accomplished by science itself. In the same way as a car can't be that own car's mechanic, as a computer can't be that, own, that computer's own repairman. Science can't evaluate science itself. 
This is where philosophy, and specifically the philosophy of science, comes in. The philosophy of science allows for critical analysis of the foundations of science, something that is required in order for science to function, but something that science itself can't achieve on its own. And thus, without philosophy, science is impossible. And this is why the philosophy of science is necessary, because science is amazing, but science can only function with philosophy, the specific sort of philosophy that investigates and analyzes science is the philosophy of science. Thus, to get very specific here, the philosophy of science is the a priori investigative endeavor that examines the descriptive questions about science's foundations concerning what science is, how science is able to function, and the normative questions about science's foundations concerning science's aims, what they ought to be, and how science ought to function in order to achieve those aims. The philosophy of science supports science by facilitating the systematic and theoretical evaluation of science's foundations that is required in order for science to function, but that science can't accomplish on its own. The philosophy of science criticizes science by showing the proper limits of the power of science and by ensuring that science doesn't attempt to transgress those limits. However, this criticism of science is still ultimately out of respect for, out of veneration for science. Science is weakened when it's used poorly in domains in which it doesn't apply. The philosophy of science ensures that this misapplication of science is minimized. So since science can't critically examine itself, science isn't able to answer what is perhaps the most important question about science, which is, what is science? The question that we started this lecture with. Answering precisely and adequately the question of what science is requires finding some criterion, some standard or measure or benchmark that all things that are science meet and that all things that are non-science fail to meet. Such a criterion would demarcate or separate science from non-science. The search for such a demarcation criterion, that is, for a standard that all science meets and that all non-science fails to meet, is at the heart of and is the jumping off point for the history of the philosophy of science, as well as any systematic study of the philosophy of science itself. This search for a demarcation criterion is known as the demarcation problem. In this lecture, we've looked at eight issues. These are 1. The nature and purpose of the empirical sciences. 2. The unified nature of the empirical sciences. 3. The demarcation criterion, scientific methodology, and scientific progress. 4. The nature and purpose of philosophy. 5. The a priori, a posteriori distinction. 6. The descriptive, normative distinction. 7 the nature and purpose of the philosophy of science, and eight, the necessity of philosophy for science. Thank you.